Just wanted to add that. Okay, uh, today's workshop is called Sketching in CAD as Partners for Design Exploration. It's my pleasure to introduce Jeff. Jeff Smith, IDSA, is an industrial designer and cloud adoption specialist at Autodesk. Jeff has a rich product design and development history. And prior to joining Autodesk, he worked for more than 20 years as design director of Reflex Design Inc., a Florida-based consulting group serving a range of domestic and international clients. The diversity of products included fitness equipment, medical, industrial, consumer, and kitchen products. Jeff also spent eight years as adjunct faculty at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. While there, Jeff taught SolidWorks, sketching, product design, personal watercraft design, and design for manufacturing. Lastly, but most important, Jeff is an RIT alum, class of 1993. So Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Dave. So let me present here. Uh, share screen and I want screen one. Okay, I talk to my computer too much, everybody. So um, let me present that one. There we go. All right, so I'll just do a quick check. You got it. You got everything good, Alex. So you can see the, the presentation, uh, right? Yes, but we, we are seeing your presenter view. I don't know if you want ah, to. Well, let, let me switch then. Let me switch screens. That's why I asked. <laughs> let's move this over here and let's present that way. No, I want to just switch my display. Swap presenter view and slideshow. Ah, look at technology working for me. Wonderful. Wow, that's on the fly too. <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome to my talk today. As I alluded to, uh, we will be doing a lot of show and tell. Um, and as Alex and Paul were talking about, there's something happening today, but on Sunday, there's something more important happening. <laughs> so I'm going to say go Bill uh, for Sunday as a lifelong Bills fan. Um, but that's my, my cell for the Bills there. So let's go back to uh, what I'm here to talk about. Um, so uh, as uh, David mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about drawing, sketching, and CAD as partners. I'm going to use Sketchbook and Fusion as my tools, but ultimately, does it matter what you use? Is it paper? Is it digital? Is it SolidWorks? Is it Fusion? Is it Inventor? Is it SketchUp? Really, it doesn't matter per se. Hopefully, I show you some things um, that from a Fusion standpoint, you say, oh, cool, um, because I work with that team. Um, so I'm going to hopefully share that. Um, but let's go past this here. And as we alluded to as well, you know, quick information about me. I'm going to tell you about my background and how I got to where I am, um, because I find that a foundation is really important, right? If you don't know my perspective, um, you're not going to get as much out of what I'm saying. And then we'll talk a little bit about sketchbook and talk a little bit about CAD. And then I'm going to ask you a question at the end, kind of about CAD as a language and where that brings us. And then we're going to go into show and tell. We're going to demonstrate um, and show things uh, from an actual usage standpoint. I'm going to break down files and I'm going to create things on the fly so we can uh, watch the process. Um, also, please do not hesitate to interrupt me and ask a question. Right. So again, we kind of know a little bit, of the, a little bit about this from me. Um, I'm RIT alumni as well. Uh, I got a BFA in industrial design. And like a lot of people in my world at that time, usually we double major the second year. So I got an AA in illustration as well. Um, I worked at Reflex Design for 20 some years. I taught as adjunct faculty. I've been an IDSA member, an advocate, an officer. Um, I've been at Autodesk for about six years. Uh, I started here on their education team for four years. I went out and helped colleges 
use our programs and implement our software. Um, my background from a tool usage, uh, at least digital, uh, is Fusion 360. I did a little bit of AutoCAD. I did a lot of SOLIDWORKS. I started with 97 plus and I used it through 2000, 2014. And I also taught it. Um, I use Alias a little. Um, I've used Sketchbook a ton. I started on the first release and I've been a beta team tester for Sketchbook since it came out and um, since being at Autodesk. Um, I use Photoshop and Illustrator a little. Um, in my career and my age, I had to make a choice at one point and I had to give up uh, the digital illustration side because I had to do concept design, CAD modeling, business development, and so on. Um, so Reflex Design uh, was a small consulting firm, um, really unusual experience. I participated in the Merit Award competition as a senior at RIT. And an alumni, Jim Gresko, had, uh, came in as a judge and had just started Reflex. And he hired me based on my presentation there. So you never know who you're going to meet and you never know what the connection is to alumni. Um, so I worked there for about three years for Jim and then Jim moved on to Kodak and uh, the owners of the company asked me if I'd take over and I spent 17 more years running and developing products there. I spent a lot of time in Asia. I spent a lot of time in Taiwan, at least four trips a year, working on projects, working on engineering, prototyping, working on the factory floor to help build things. Um, so I got a lot of hands-on experience in that world. Um, one of the things that stuck with me is concept development. And one of the things I did over that time was drawing and sketching a lot. Um, but I think there are some critical things that I'll touch on today, um, which is the combination of visual numbers to identify things and notes. So it's language and visual together, right? And I feel that really helps communication, right? I've done a lot of products in the fitness world, um, so much so it gets a little bit monotonous. But I show this one as just kind of one example. And this is a line of fitness equipment I worked on. And this pedal crank is the only custom pedal crank that the company ever designed in 20 years. Everything else was off the shelf for pedal cranks. And that's part of the manufacturing and design world. Um, lots of fitness equipment. Um, I've done a lot of industrial equipment. This is a battery tester. Um, and again, this image is kind of the genesis for this presentation. I did this in 2009, obviously by the date, but it's, it's a combo pack of CAD and sketching. And the genesis here is I'm stuck in Taiwan in a factory. I have to communicate a direction change to leadership around the globe. Like, wait a second, we're going this way now. We've changed everything. Here's why. And we're in CAD process. But if you merge these two worlds, it takes a step back towards concept, even though you're in CAD, right? And I guess this is kind of what, you know, brings me to what I'm talking about today is, the, is, is to how to leverage these two sides of the coin. Um, again, then the prototype for that specific product just as a tie-in uh, for that one. Um, and then lots of CAD modeling, lots of renderings for marketing, lots of art direction for photography of products, lots more, um, even more. Um, a lot of uh, medical equipment as well. And, and one of the things that helped keep us sane when we were working was to do contrasting projects. So doing a small glucose meter like this with a battery and a small chip and board is very different than doing a full-size treadmill with all the systems involved in that. And I think the two complement each other and refresh the designer. So I'm a huge proponent, if you're working in a company, in circulation of 
uh, products. And I think that's what kept the people that were at Reflex there was that we, we had a revolving door of a variety of products. So if you're working on a treadmill and then you switch and now you're working on a food you know, vacuum storage product, that's a really nice contrast. Um, so we tried to really keep everyone fresh. And I think both of the people that worked there stayed there for an average of 10 years. So by keeping people learning, empowered, doing different products, keep, you keep people involved. Most people leave companies because they're bored of what they're doing and they want new challenges. Um, this one happens to be a uh, steamer product for a smaller steamer. Um, this is a uh, liquor chiller, not big for me, but you know, hey, I'm happy to help you with anything. Um, what's very funny is that um, I did a lot of work in this fitness industry. And if you think about fitness products, they're furniture, right? They're part of your home if you do home fitness. And I tried really hard to get wood and fabric into it because let's involve it in this world. And so now I have a piece of appliance that gets faux wood that I was told to use. And I'm like, gosh, darn it. This is not what I wanted to do. But this is the only piece that I got that element in, right? Um, lots of food storage as well. And I, I show this one because, um, because it's a very um, different setup in that regard, right? So it's a family, right? Give me one second. Right? So um, the reason I show this one is that when you design a family, there's a lot of economy of tooling that you need to think about, right? And the, the elements of how those things go together, right? So the biggest side here on the left, it uses all the parts, but the economy of scale, the two on the right are almost the same tooling. Two thirds of the tooling is the same, right? And so how to create SKUs and work in that world where you're selling products but you're economizing tooling. That's reality for our design world, right? And I show these two as a indication of taking that a step further. We were hired to do a skin of this only. The very front of these are the only pieces we did. The rest was old product, right? And was gonna be completely recycled. So I'd say maybe a quarter of the product we, we designed here. But the one on the left was for Sam's Club. The one on the right was for Costco. So they could say they had an exclusive for a specific product. Um, so it's not always from scratch. Sometimes your parameters are, how do I design something to be sold in this channel? And how do I design something to be sold in this channel? Right? Um, sometimes it is ground up, right? This is a ground up uh, uh, humidifier tool and it had to have specific requirements. And we were part of the team that, that developed the process and how it works. So we started with internal components and worked our way out. Um, one of the interesting things is that it had to be able to hold five gallons of water. And for a home environment, carrying five gallons of water and separating it into two tanks that wouldn't leak when you took one off um, was an interesting experience for me. Um, I've done soft goods. Um, I've done pet products that look like urinals, but I guess if you're a dog, this is a win, right? Um, but I show this as an example to say, hey, um, you know, I did a sketch. Next thing you know, the client's coming back with a CAD model and saying we're going to production. So you don't know uh, what's going to happen in those regards. Um, I like to show this kitty litter project that I was involved in. Um, because to me, this is kind of summary of my design philosophy and not because it's a kitty litter box, but, um, the customer came to me and they said, we'd like you to help get around this patent. We'd like to design from scratch. Um, and it's a kitty litter box. And my attitude is typically, yes, how can I help? Thank you for wanting to work with me. And no matter what the problem is, 
diving into it and figuring out the process, it all matters, right? Um, I'm always grateful when someone wants to work with me because it, it means that I'm bringing something to the table. So I try and bring that passion with me, even if it's a catheter box, right? So um, keep that in the back of your mind, right? Um, again, all kinds of blenders and things of that nature. So I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a flavor from where I'm coming from, right? So this brings it back to sketching and drawing for me. Um, sketching has always been a part of what I've done. Um, so drawing, sketching, I was trained more, a little more traditional where it was kind of the last of a group that was taught how to draw on toned paper and with pastels um, and markers. Um, so that's kind of my core. Um, and I include the, the, the train in the upper left there because that's actually a pivotal image for me. Um, that's probably a good 12, 14 years ago. Um, but I started drawing on this, these colored papers again, and I was drawing with my son and he had some white pencils and I just used, you know, this white pencil and I, it brought me back to what I had learned before. And now I kind of embraced that and I've gone forward with, with what I used to do. So, um, I also do a lot of digital. So I do a lot of concept work in sketchbook. Again, these, some of these are older, some of these are newer. Um, some of these are more current as well, depending on what the product is. Um, like I mentioned to, to, to Paul and Alex and what, before we started, you know, I'm not paid to be a designer now. So um, it's really on me to keep pushing my skill set if I want to retain it. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I still draw a lot is because it's my tactile um, link to this world that I'm part of, right? Um, so if you follow me on Instagram, it's Blaster701. Um, and I was super late to joining and I was uh, reluctant to join. I did not want to do it. I did not want to start a, um, another channel that, um, that took time and, <laughs> and things, but I'm exceptional, exceptionally grateful on this end now because it motivates me more. And I draw now more than when I was a designer. Um, I kind of like myself as my customer um, because I'm doing what I want to do, when I want to do it. And it's pushed me to draw new shapes, new forms, new things. You see me do a lot of cars. I'm trying to get better at transportation, right? You know, doing fantasy things is, is, is more forgiving because there's really no reality, but everyone knows the proportions of a car. So I tend to push myself and try and do more of that. Um, again, I do digital, I've done demos. We're gonna talk about the Camaro here uh, shortly. Um, I did the center right one at a thought at work conference. Um, did other ones at demos around here and there. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, this X-Wing today, and I'm going to give you guys an insight into how I use the program to build this, how I use traditional techniques to talk about this. Um, and I kind of bring it around full circle here. Um, and this is, to me, an example of a traditional workflow, right? So I was at a Thought at Work conference the other year. I think this is 2015. Um, and on the way home, on one of my plane rides, I sketched out the watch drawing. And I'm like, oh, cool, I'll do this, and I'll, uh, I'll post it on my Instagram, and great. So on one flight, I did that. Uh, about two weeks later, I wanted to test some knowledge in Fusion and push my, my, my knowledge set, so I built this concept, right? So for you guys, this is a very normal workflow. I'm going to do a drawing, I'm going to experiment with a drawing, and now I'm going to make a CAD file perfectly valid, works great. Um, but I want to counter that with other options today. We'll talk about this, but we'll also talk about a two-way street and how things can go both ways, right? Um, 
I've done a lot of work with Wacom. Um, my friend Amber challenged me a lot and uh, Amber helped me uh, to push a little farther with, with using a pen to do CAD. Right. And so I use their hardware and I use like I think right now I'm using one of their um, Intuo tablets. Later, I'll use one of their mobile studio pros. So that's what I'm using for hardware. Right. So. If you ask the question, why are sketching and CAD good teammates? I feel that there is a symbiotic relationship between these two skill sets in our design world. I feel that there's a little too much of a pigeonhole. So if you're good at drawing, the world pushes you that way. And they say, you're going to be the drawing concept person. If you're good at CAD and you are fast and you, you can model things in a very complex nature, the world pushes you to be the CAD person. And I understand the reason why because it comes down to dollars and cents. If you're fast in one, you can generate more revenue doing that one. I was in the right place at the right time and in the right position where I was able to retain both. And both evolved together. And that's kind of what brought me to this symbiotic relationship. And it was a learning process because I was drawing more complex forms. And then I had to model that in CAD. And that pushed my CAD skills. I had to figure out a way to do it, right? And if you're using CAD frequently, you're having to think in 3D, looking at 3D on a 2D plane. And so therefore you're always moving and adjusting the model and that actually has an effect on the processing in your brain where you can move and spin things in your head better, which then has an effect on your drawing because you can predict viewpoints and predict perspectives, which makes you a better drawer. Then you push the drawing, which pushes the CAD, which then you have constant experiences of intersections. What happens to shapes when they collide, when they hit each other, when they flow from one to the other? The CAD experience then helps your drawing experience. So no matter what you're drawing, you can predict the intersections of geometry better without using the computer. Not to say that both aren't valid, but if you take that perspective that the two can help each other, that's a really good thing. All right. So my last question before we go forward here is, is CAD or when does CAD become a language? If you look at our education process, we all learn a language, we all learn writing, we all learn math, science, and so on. At what point in time does CAD become part of that world? If you think about it, our first language or communication is probably drawing. You are drawing shapes before you're writing letters. So drawing is critical. And how you make that bridge to CAD, what happens when the younger generations, as they are now, are learning Tinkercad in fourth grade? Tinkercad is a monster product with 26 million users. What happens when these students who are in fourth grade now get to college? And CAD is a language for them. All of us, people using CAD, engineers, designers, manufacturers, we're this segment of the population. What happens when the population as a whole starts to use CAD? So that's my... That's my thought provoking, where are we going uh, question for right now. All right, so that's enough for PowerPoint. I'll say pause, any questions there, and we'll go forward from here. Okay, awesome. So this is my Instagram page. You guys may follow me. Um, and you can see here that there's a predominant 
um, <laughs> medium, okay? So yeah, you'll see here, this is a Fusion file. Technically, this is a Fusion file and this is a Fusion file, but there are a lot of marker renderings with some mixed in sketchbook drawings, Fusion files, but the predominant theory here is I do a lot of drawing on paper. Drawing on paper is awesome. It's wonderful. It's kind of my foundation. You should draw on paper because all of those skills apply well to digital. But it's again, a two way street. You can work between the two and you can have each one influence the other. And I'm looking for a specific image that I'm gonna start with. And as soon as I get there, elbows. And come on. Okay, I, I do a lot of drawing, that's good. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with this image and I'm gonna talk about traditional workflow and how that traditional workflow um, is applied. And some of this might be normal to you, um, but hopefully looking in and peeling back the orange and the layers to say, hey, here's how I do it, it may influence you. So this drawing is 2017. I did it out having coffee on a coffee break. And I, I have this interesting theory in my head. If I can't think of something to draw, I pick sort of a classic muscle car and make it a flying speeder. So if I don't, you know, have something creative to do, that's what I do. So it makes me draw. So if that helps you to find out a way to make you draw, great. So I did this drawing. It's one view, it's one direction. Um, and I haven't thought about anything else. No top view, no side view. Um, no rear. Let me just open the chat. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks for owning a product, Paul. <laughs> um, uh, so did my drawing, did my marker rendering, put it away. Okay. Now let's talk about that process of investigating how the rest of it looks, right? So this is very traditional. I have my marker sketch, and then I use sketchbook to create some elevation views. And this is a twofold win here. So I'm using them to create images that I can put in my CAD file, but I'm also using them to figure out the shapes. And this is a very traditional technique, right? If I turn off some of my layers here, okay, or turn on one of them, right? You can see that I've used sketchbook as a drafting tool. I simply projected views, projected lines. I have some quick thumbnails here that I use as an underlay. And if I turn these off, you can clearly see that I just sketched these out, right? Those are just thumbnails to give me what this intent is. And this is gonna be a theme for everything I show you today drawing wise is there's nothing wrong with tracing your work. So this is me trying to figure it out. They're loose, they're sketchy, and I'm just trying to relate front view to right view to top view, right? There's not magic. You know this technique, use this technique, right? You, Jeff, could I uh, yeah. interrupt? Quick question. Can you tell us what part of this is done digitally and what part is done by hand? Did you scan anything? Is this all digital? This is all digital. You saw this sketch already, right? Oops, I don't want to do that. I want to move that. There we go. So this was um, the sketch that I did on marker. And I literally just cut this out of the photo I took and put it here and mirrored it so I could get my mind to think differently. And this is 100% digital. But Kim, ultimately, you could do it on paper too, who cares? But I'm using a very traditional method of just simply drawing lines, right? And if you do it with a ruler, great. 
I use the ruler here in Sketchbook just to drag lines across in a different color. And I use red so I'd have another color for my mind, very similar that you would do with a blue line pencil. So I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm just using a digital tool just like I would use a paper tool. Does that answer the question, Kim? I'll go for yes. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. So, and then all I did was basically I treated my layers as a new uh, piece of paper. And I then transferred these images, right, to a cleaner layer that I didn't have to worry about that underlay layer anymore. And once I turn these off, the line work is clean. I cheated digitally and I used the symmetry tool to be able to draw these at the same time, left and right or top and bottom, right? So that's a great element that you have with a uh, digital tool. But at the same time, you could do that with a copy machine and turn something over and trace the other side. That's how you do it on paper, okay? I'm not reinventing the wheel, I'm just using an efficient tool, right? And then all I did was block in a little bit of color and a little bit of detail and a little bit of shadow and highlight just so I could see what the forms would do. So again, there's two reasons I did this drawing. One was to figure out what other parts looked like. Two, to give myself underlays for CAD, right? So now I clearly have a right, a front, and a top, and how these orient. And you can see clearly like the difference in the form right here versus the difference in the form here and how much smoother that transition became for the front, quote, fender, right? So I evolved as I went from my baseline. Okay, so let's go in a traditional direction. Oh my goodness, we don't want to look Godzilla right now. Um, so when I came to Fusion, right, Fusion was a new tool for me. My, you know, as you guys know, my background was SolidWorks, right? So there are plenty of things that transition across. Solid modeling, surface modeling, great. But Fusion has this tool set for creating form, which allows you to model and use subdivisional forms, which gives you a lot more freedom. And as a parametric modeler, this scared the crap out of me, right? Like, how do I deal with this tool? So this literally was me challenging myself to adopt this methodology. But I used my background and my foundation as the starting point. So I'm gonna go back in time to the beginning of this file and I'm gonna turn on my canvases, which should make complete sense to all of you. So if I go to my front view here, let's turn on perspective with ortho faces. All I did was map my intent for my front view and scaled it. My side view and my top view. So now I have a clear understanding of where I'm going and what this thing is gonna look like. Now, if you're not doing this with CAD, I would highly suggest it. This is a very traditional workflow, paper to CAD. And I did some quick sketches to orient my space and position, right? And let's edit this here. And let's show you my mistake, right? And so this is me starting to get better and learn this form tool. And this is not a good <laughs> way to do it, but it's my learning process. I come from a age that is very trial and error and trial and learning, right? If you have a failure like this, learn from it. It's not just a failure. You can't get everything right every time. So that's my failure right there. Did not work. And then I went forward and I learned from that failure and I got to a better form, right? And if I edit this, you can see that I've opened the door towards where I need to go, 
right? I've got a secondary surface body here on the front that I'm gonna use to cut this thing later. And this, that literally having those two there opened my eyes to what I could do here and how I could leverage my history. But one of the most important things I learned about using this tool is line control and controlling these lines. You could see right here, and Alex probably sees it, I've got this lovely T shape here. That to me is not a good way to orient. And you've got all these little edges and things that don't line up correctly, but across the front of the hood here, I've got a lot of good things happening, right? And I've got a lot of bad things happening down here, but it's me learning, right? This is me challenging myself on learning a new tool set, right? And so how to build this and articulate it and go down the stream, right? So I'm gonna pull that to the end, let it calculate it for a second. And now I'm here and I have a much better understanding of what this form is. And this to me is just a mock-up model. It's just a way to quickly build something. But I chose to push myself further, right? And this is something that I will touch on later as well. But if I move and articulate this wing, the other side articulates as well. Both sides move and articulate together. And that was my first experiment for really capitalizing on how components work in fusion, right? And I'm gonna talk about concepting here and I'm gonna use this rear engine as kind of my, my learning procedure. So when I did that concept sketch, even the ones I did in, in sketchbook, these rear sections here, I still had no idea what these were gonna look like. So building this engine pod helped me open a door for myself on how I worked, right? And how I did things. So very traditional, very moving things forward, right? I did a drawing, I did another drawing, and I did another CAD file based on that. Okay, so I'm gonna jump to the flip side and show you another way to experiment and model in CAD. So this is my current Camaro model that I'm working on, all right? And this is me challenging myself to be accurate and to push my CAD system forward. So if I turn on my canvases here, you can see that my canvases are an actual image of that, this car, right? So I wanna push my level forward. And if I roll back to here, you can see those canvases are very easy to see, and it's simple, straightforward. They're scaled and oriented, so I have a point of reference. So whether it's my drawing or whether I'm trying to create something, I chose an actual car, so I wouldn't be creating the design intent. This is a focused CAD exploration to get better at CAD. So if I go one step forward here and I edit this form session, and I'll turn off my canvases, there is a marked difference between this session and the floating model I just showed you. And it is a attention to form as a surface modeler. So my background is parametric surface modeling. So if I was gonna model this in SOLIDWORKS, I would have done sketches to create all these surfaces and all these elements and all these details. And it would almost be time prohibitive. There's no way I'm gonna do this for fun on my own to build a model this complex. And here's where this purple button comes into its benefit. I treated it as a surface tool. So this generates a surface for me, as does the greenhouse. And they're very clean and very simple. And I now have two surface bodies that generate these lovely surfaces. 
And then I go through my system of leveraging my background to treat those as a surface model, which if you've done that as well in SOLIDWORKS, you do the same principle and you work your way through that system to push things in that regard, right? And so now I've learned my reason for showing you these two models is to show you my learning process that you're never done. You're always learning, right? Whether it's drawing, whether it's CAD, whether it's concept development, it's about learning new pathways and learning new tools. So never stop pushing yourself is the whole point, right? So with that in mind, let's go from here and let's flip the coin the other way, right? So let me switch to sketchbook and let me open another file, right? No, I don't want to save anything. Thank you, right? And let's go to um, this model here or sketch, I should say, which I like to talk about from the standpoint of how I did it and how I concept this, right? Um, it's a Battlestar Galactica Viper. I participate sometimes in a, you know, a Facebook sketch group um, called Sketch Wars. One of my former students started it. So if you win, you get to pick the next week's thing. So I picked Battlestar Galactica and this is the drawing I did. Um, but again, this is a quick concept sketch. And that's why I want to talk about it because this is the inverse of the traditional, I'm gonna do a drawing and then I'm gonna do a CAD file, right? This is, I'm gonna do a CAD file so my drawing is faster, okay? So here is um, this image. But when I open up and show you the steps, it's the opposite, okay? So let me just grab the layers I need and let's go in the other direction. And let's turn on the fusion image and turn off the sketch image, right? And let's turn that opacity up. So whatever your CAD source is, I use fusion here, right? This is not a hard model to make in CAD. It's like a couple extrudes, maybe a cylinder, a flat plane, and then you mirror the whole thing. It's simple, it's five to 10 minutes worth of work. Great. If I do this rendering in CAD, it gives me a lot of base information. It gives me a really nice perspective. It gives me a drop shadow. It gives me a horizon line. And my sketch just got a lot easier. Could I lay out this sketch in a technical drawing? Yes, I could do it. I have the experience. You've been trained to do technical drawing. You can, but speed is power. So sometimes you're better off doing speed. So what it also does for you, someone like me that's slightly indecisive about what view to do, it also gives you a rapid exploration of, do I like this one? Do I like this one? Oh, wait, I like that view. Well, this one might be fun too. And I probably rendered like four more that I didn't put in here, but it allowed me to look and figure out the composition and said, this is the right one, right? When you looked at those images, I can say, this is the one. And then I can go through my process and say, I'm going to do, let me break down this image really quick. I'll turn this one on. I'll tone that off for a second. And step one is what you would do anyway. I've laid out some quick vanishing points. So these ruler lines going off into the right vanishing point are easy to establish because the CAD model is just a rectilinear form. So I can just trace lines and bang, I have my right vanishing point. And if I do a center line down the main piece of the fuselage, I got the center line going back to the left vanishing point. Life is good. 
And then I can quickly lay out one sketch. And that's this sketch here. And if you notice and contrast, right, between the thumbnail sketch and the CAD file, I didn't have to project the drop shadow. I didn't have to figure out the horizon line. And I'm able to add detail. And I know the detail is correct in perspective because it lines up with what's there, right? If you draw an underlay, if you model an underlay, it doesn't matter, right? Any way you can get faster makes you better. It makes you explore more ideas. If I spent 20 minutes less setting up the underlay and I explored three more ideas, I'm winning, right? The customer's winning, the company's winning, right? Whoever it is, I can explore more, right? And the more ideas you explore, the better the final should be, right? And so if I go through this and I turn this down a little bit more and I then go ahead and turn on a couple layers from that, right? I'll turn on my shadow and detail layer. And then I think I got a little highlight in there and I'll turn off this one. We get to the point where we have a clean, simple sketch. I didn't even retrace this one. This is simple, clean, and it's an underlay. Right? I'm going to hold there for one second, say, because I just flipped the coin. Any questions there so far? I have a question. Yeah. Hi, this is Ariel. Um, so when you say quick, <laughs> what is quick to you? So you're saying like to do this specific layer right here, just this one. Um, yeah, just like in general, um, like how, how much time do you spend on like this? And like, even, even prior, like the, um, 3d modeled cars and things like that. Okay. So if you talk about this specific sketch, I mean, this thumbnail is maybe 30 minutes, maybe if that mm -hmm. could be 15, if I go fast, right. Depends. Right, the, uh, the 3D car models take more time. Those are hours and hours, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, but like I would probably say the yellow Camaro, the more accurate actual car, um, that's probably 20 hours worth of work pushing that through. Having done that experience now, I'm faster. I'm better at it because I've adopted a new tool set there. Right. Um, the gray Camaro, the floating one probably took me 40 hours to figure that out because I didn't know what I was doing there. Right. And I had a lot of trial and error. Um, uh, but I would say that if you want to talk about time, uh, most of my marker renderings that I post are probably 30 minutes of a line drawing and 30 to 45 marker rendering of strict actual time to do it. Do I do it all in one sitting? Usually not. Usually I do 15 minutes of drawing, I get something laid out and then I'll go do something else. And then I'll come back and just polish it off for 15 minutes. And then maybe the next day I'll spend 30 minutes marker rendering it, right? So I tend to break things up. I usually don't go straight through um, just because life doesn't let me. <laughs> There's too many things going on. Um, that's usually the reason. Um, but again, I'm drawing for me now. I'm not drawing on a, on a, on a time clock. Um, if I was drawing on the time clock, efficiency matters because the more you can do, the more you can pump out. You know, it, there, is, there is a reason why sketch by the pound is there. The more you can do, the more valuable you are. The more you do, the better you are. Again, the more diversity of concepts you produce, the better the final direction will be. Because when you do a diversity, you're learning what the wrong way to go is, right? If you get rid of lots and lots and lots of ideas, you're flushing the best ones to the top. 
right? You want dead ends. You want to explore something and say, oh, no, this is not the way, you know, uh, not the way I want to do this, right? You know, it, it, to me, that's been my experience. Does that answer your question or did I go way off on a tangent? No, that was actually helpful. Very helpful. Okay, okay good. Any more questions before we go forward? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you showed us your, um, your, uh, your renderings on, um, that colored paper, what was mm -hmm. the type of, were you using a, a type of marker for that or a type of pen? Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I have a why since we're here, right. And you're asking, right. I mean, one second. Um, so for marker rendering, I, I use, um, I use these, la if I can get in focus, there we go. I use these Lamy pens a lot. Um, they're ballpoint. They're a nice pen. Um, I really like them from a design standpoint. I'm really frustrated that they won't notice me because I tag them a lot. Um, <laughs> but and it's like a $22 pen. It's not like, you know, it's Wacom that gives me computers, right? <laughs> it's a $22 pen, right? Um, they're great tools, though. I, I won't say anything bad about them. I've got several of them. Um, from a marker standpoint, I tend to use uh, these Windsor Newton markers a lot. Um, I've done some collaboration with them, helped them develop some stuff. So I use theirs. They're nice. But if you use uh, Prismacolor, if you use Copic, Copic, whatever you want to say, does it AP, you know, AD markers, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's what you're comfortable with. I find that the... Windsor Newton or the Prismacolor style, they're alcohol, so they're almost the same. Um, on the toned Canton paper or construction paper, combined with the ballpoint, there is bleed, but it's manageable, right? Um, if you're using marker paper, which I don't use as much anymore, I've kind of grown to not like it. <laughs> I find it too slippery and, you know, I, I just don't use it as much anymore as when I was younger. Um, you know, something like a uh, razor point or a felt pen is gonna is gonna bleed less. So there's a there's a time and place for that. But I found that on tone paper and the papers I'm using, I like ballpoint and alcohol based markers. I know I went a long way to answer that question, but that's kind of what I'm using lately. And that's why I show it. Like if you follow my Instagram, I'm like. Here, I'm using this Lamy pen and I'm using this marker, right? That's what I'm doing. Um, All right. Thanks. Does that answer? Okay. Yep. Good. Any other questions? Um, yeah, just one quick one. Sure. Um, I have a question about your forms and forms in general. So I'm just, just thinking about using this process for myself. And yep. one thing that comes to mind is if I'm doing like three sketches over, say, for example, a car or say mm -hmm. it's a wagon. And if I decide, okay, maybe this form doesn't work. Maybe I should change it. It should I go, will I just go back into fusion, change it, come back? Or would I like, cause in my hot mind, I'm thinking I may have to just go back and go into fusion every few, mm -hmm. every like sketch or show because there's something that's in the actual form I want to change? That's a good question, right? That's a good question. But is it, is it actually 100% either way? No, right? If it's a huge change, yeah, you're going to have to. But let's just take this, for example, right? Um, so I can also use my information as a guideline, right? So... If I'm, let me just grab a new layer here really quickly, All right? There we go. And I don't have my window up here. Turn the brush puck on, the color puck on, and where's my brush palette? Not showing my brush palette on another screen. Maybe, let's, whoops. There we go. There's my layers. My brush palette's not liking me. Okay, so we're just gonna grab a brush here then. I'm gonna say, we'll just use the pencil now, new layer. And so I'll use the red here. Okay, so theoretically, 
right? Even if this is my drawing here, and I want to make this form come down like this and go back, right? And I want to have this element be a much larger detail on the front, right? I don't need to do a CAD file to change that. I can use my drawing ability to say it's going to do this now, right? And it's going to go like this. And I've made a fairly dramatic change in my intent for what this thing looks like. Does that make sense? I'm drawing with my tools here, not the screen. So it's like, ah, um, does that make sense? Does that help answer a little bit? Um, yeah, do you do, do you do that a lot and just follow the vanishing guidelines from the original fusion or? 100%, 100%, yes, because if you're doing a very drastic change, yeah, sure, quickly go change it in, in fusion. Yes, but if I'm doing a minor change, like I, I want this to be a completely different form, right? Just do another layer here and explore it. You know, there's nothing wrong with that mm. because it all still makes sense, right? So if I turn on my vanishing lines and I have my image on here, I can, I can manipulate it. I could add, you know, if I wanted to, I could say, well, I've got this detail here, right? Let's add, you know, a wing detail down here, right? It goes into the engine. It doesn't matter. I can add that right now. And that would vastly change it, right? Let's say that, you know, I wanted this to, to be connected to the fuselage here, right? Why not? I can do all that here. All of these things can be articulated with drawing. And that's Kind of where I'm going is to say drawing is just as important as CAD and they have a symbiotic relationship. There are times when drawing is faster. There are times when CAD is faster. There are times when you go, I'm drawing, I'm drawing, I'm drawing, I'm drawing CAD. There are times when you say, yeah, give me a quick CAD model. Let me explore something quickly. Oh, wait, I want to change it. Let's draw it now, right? There's value to both sides and there's no right and wrong answer, right? Leverage it and leverage what you feel comfortable with. I'm very comfortable saying, I'm just gonna change the drawing really quick. You might be more comfortable saying, I'm gonna quickly modify the CAD file and get it in position. Fine, there's nothing wrong with either one of those. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Any more Never questions there? Okay. Yeah, appreciate All right. it. Jeff. Good, no worries. Any other questions? Okay. Let's go a step forward then, right? And let's talk about why, why drawing matters and why CAD matters. And this is an older drawing I did, but I find that it's really important to know what you're showing to people. And I like to use this drawing as a, as a, as a highlight on knowing as, as designers, we all can read drawings. We can all read CAD files. We can all read renderings. But you've got to remember that the other people in the room probably can't. There's a good chance that other people can't read the rendering. They can't read the sketch. They might need a prototype in front of them to see it. And know that polished CAD renderings bring a sense of completeness to a meeting. And if I show up to a meeting and I've got beautiful CAD renderings that are photorealistic, the business people, the manufacturing people, they read that as it's complete. If I show up with a sketch, there's room for exploration, evolution, and communication. So as a designer, you should know the implication of the method you're showing. And there's a time and place for all of those. For example, this sketch here is really a CAD file but I put the sketch information on it to make it more open. 
it says we're not finished yet. We're a team on how we're going to develop this. And I use my drawing ability to give that feeling. So if I look at my layers and I turn them off, right? And I say, let's turn off the shadow. Let's turn off the white, the lines, the details, and the elements. Let me go one higher there to that one. Now you can clearly see that's a rendering of a CAD file with depth of focus turned on. So it quickly becomes photorealistic. But by me layering sketch information on top of it, it quickly takes on the motif of we're not quite done with this yet. It looks like a sketch, even though it's a CAD file. I show this to you to say there's a time and a place for both. If you know where you're going is right, CAD file, like this is the way we're going. If you're looking to collaborate, having some sketch quality to it is also very valuable. And it took me no time to do a couple of quick sketch lines in a little bit of shadow, 10 minutes maybe, over a render. All right? So I find that very valuable in that regard. All right? Any questions there? No? Okay, good. All right. So let's talk about some traditional aspects of drawing, right? And I like to use this X-Wing here as, as my methodology, right? And you saw the final image, so I'm not going to show you the final yet. I'm going to talk about and open up how I draw. And I'm showing you a digital, but it could be done on paper too, right? So let's go down here and let's open up all the secrets, right? So let's turn off this layer, turn off this layer. Oops, not that layer. Turn that layer off and turn this layer off and turn this layer on because it is the most important, right? Again, I'm old school. I did a lot of tracing over photography. So whether I took the picture, whether I grabbed a resource image, I did a lot of drawing over things. And I'm a huge believer in tracing for development. Whether you're tracing a picture, whether you're tracing your own sketch, whether you're doing it over and over again, take out a fresh piece of paper, put it over it, fix it. Again, I didn't want to do the development work. Could I have built a CAD file for this? Yes, I could have knocked one together, but no, I just grabbed an image and I was unsure of which composition was better going this way or going this way. If anybody knows me, why did I choose the one going to the left as where I went? And it's a technical question. Okay, since no one has a guess, I'm left-handed. And the main vanishing point of this product going off to the left is biomechanically easier for me. If you're right-handed, this is biomechanically easier for you, both in your hand connection to your body and mentally. If you go back and look at your own work, if you're left-handed, you'll have more sketches going to the left. If you're right-handed, you'll have more sketches going to the right. Make yourself do the other one. I would call it your weak side, right? And if you look at my Instagram page, you'll see me flip all the time because I'm working on my weaker perception, both on my hand and in my head, right? It's challenging. It makes you think. All right. But I was I was I was going the easy route here and I went with the bio biomechanically stronger way. And again, I did my layout. I treated this like a drawing. And the first thing I did 
was lay out my intent. And I did that with simple, quick two layers to give myself my vanishing point and my layout. This is pure and simple technical drawing. I used two pieces of paper or two layers and I gave it main vanishing point and I gave it wing orientation. I wanted to change this intent, but the wings are really important. So locating those in space, 3D space, was very important. And so I'm gonna add a quick concept sketch for what my main fuselage and engines would look like. And then I added some details for the wings. And if I turn off my layout structure, you can see I'm at this point now where I've got those rough images in there. And if you think about it, I've done one, two, three, four drawings to get to here. And since I had that information in line, I could do a cleanup layer. And as I turn up this blue layer, it's very easy to understand how now I'm cleaning my intent for what this is gonna look like. And now I have a nice clean concept. It's in perspective, my orientation lines up, and I've got my intent of what this design will be. And like the other sketch that was in blue, this is one layer. And if I'm gonna go further here, I'm gonna push this down the realm, right? And I'm gonna start my breakdown and I'm gonna do these clean evolution layers. And as if I turn those black layers on, and I'll go ahead and turn off my guideline layer, and the difference between this, I don't wanna call it sloppy, gestural, it's a better way to say it, blue line to very crisp, clean line work. To me, this is the critical part. I'm a line drawer. I like clean, attention to detail, every line deserves good quality lines, right? That's my theory. And I did these to create this relationship. And that clean element of two separate layers of both an exterior and an interior, if you're using Photoshop, Sketchbook works very similar, where I can say, um, give me my magic wand and select out here. So this clean line work allows me really easy selections for cleaning or deleting or erasing, right? And then I still have details inside. If I come down here and go to the bottom of my layer construction, okay? And I turn on this layer. This, this layer dates me, right? So if I'm a marker renderer, I have a test sheet with me and I'm testing colors. I'm testing what they look like. This is kind of the color palette that I want to use. Um, Sketchbook has a, a Copic library in here. And what's really nice is if you pick one of them, they give you complementary colors here. And it's a really nice way to set up a color palette that you can use and build from. It's, it's quick and easy and it makes me think differently because we all like certain color combinations. So I use this to make me think differently. So here's my color layout. And then I simply start to block in color. And even as I get to here, where it's literally almost paint by numbers, is really where I'm at right now. All I did was block in the color. The lines are what makes your eye start to read the form better. 
And that's why I value the line so much. There are many other ways to draw and paint where you don't use lines. Um, a lot of the concept artists do a rapid painting technique where you block in shapes and you refine details. I don't necessarily work that way. I'm a line-based guy. So then I split things up into layers, right? And I start to add elements because it's controllable and easy layer strategy where I'm starting to add shadows and highlights, right? And if you notice, these layers here start to tell you where the light's coming from and start to tell you more about the form. And I'm using the lines and your eyes perception to help sculpt this shape, even though it's 2D. Your eye reads things a certain way, and I know that. And that's what I'm building on. Someone like Scott Robertson, he does a lot of tonal and then changes it to color. I like doing an overlay method um, that allows me to do it in these steps. Both are valid. I just think this way better. And as I add more darker darks, the form starts to come out. And you can really start to see where the light's coming from. And then as I add lighter light and slight color details, it starts to come through. Let me turn on my background so you can see a little bit more of what the contrast is. And my background is just a pastel wash. That's all I did in a digital manner, all right? I think that's just a little bit of detail, okay? And as I come up here, I start to add more to it. And layer 24 right here adds a little more highlight. And layer 15 is, to me, one of the two critical layers. And as I turn this one off, your eye can see the form. But now, just by adding those crisp highlights, your eye is used to seeing those. And it helps pull out the highlights and angles where things change. And this one here, 25, I was always taught that white pencil should be the most time consuming step of any marker rendering. Now, did I take that to heart too much? Maybe, maybe, um, but it's all the little details here and it looks like it almost comes into focus when I turn that on. So having the ability to crisp those little edges, and I mean every little edge. If I zoom in here, that highlight right here is so much more powerful when I give it those reflections. Maybe a little too much, but I really like that element to it. And I find that my technique lends itself well to that strategy. And then we add some darker darks in the cockpit, some lighter lights on the cockpit for the glass, some little elements for the jet engine, some glow elements, glow elements. I guess I shouldn't call it a jet engine, whatever propulsion methodology it is, right? And I add some quick elements there, right? And a little signature and some quick motion blur, right? And so this is me applying a very strict marker rendering technique to a digital tool. When I use Sketchbook, I'm literally doing a marker rendering. I, I, I didn't grow up digital, I grew up with marker. So the translation to digital, that's how I bridge it, right? And so all of these aspects are really powerful, I think, right? Okay, I've got, go ahead. Jeff, um... We, we have a question, uh, Jamison, yeah. do you want to ask it directly? Should we ask it for you? So how, is that yours, Jamison? How, do, how are you able to get those thin, crisp lines for the outline? Is there a specific tool brush I use? Um, I'll show you when I switch machines um, and I do some drawing, but I literally use the standard tools. So that's just a white pencil. Right, so I use the pencil tool in Fusion or in Sketchbook, and I just change it to white. That's it. That's all it is. 
there's no magic sauce there. That's just too many years of practice. <laughs> right. Um, but again, I treat it like a marker rendering. Um, it's simple and easy, right. As far as what I'm doing, I'm not, there's no, maybe simple and easy isn't the right term, maybe direct and to the point is a better way to say it. Right. Any more questions before we go from here? Okay, let's go for it, right? Okay, so I'm gonna use Fusion here. If you're not familiar with Fusion, um, I know that there are plenty of ways for you to get information and I can connect you with lots of people, right? Because I work on a team that uh, helps people use Fusion, right? So what I'm gonna do is kind of open the door here to what I did uh, for the, the Battlestar Galactic uh, uh, Viper sketch, right? I did a CAD file and then I did a sketch off of it. So I'm literally just gonna make a quick underlay in Fusion for a concept thing, right? Um, and just give myself and create an underlay and I'll do it live so we can see it and you can see how much time it could or should take. Um, I personally, for when I talk about this, I like to use um, I like to use uh, a tank as my uh, whether it's a hover tank or a dr driving tank or whatever. But there's a there's an element to tanks that it, it brings up a really critical drawing challenge, right? And if you have a car, it's one body. If you have a tank you have a turret that rotates and that becomes a very complicated drawing question, right? Um, so that's why I like to use something like that when I do this quick sketch, right? So all I'm gonna do here is build an underlay and I'm gonna do CAD first and then we're gonna switch to drawing, right? So if you see something that I do, ask me, stop me, no problem, right? All right, so let's do this, All right? So I'm gonna sketch over here and I'm gonna give myself some rough layout here. Just to give myself something to deal with, right? Good enough, right? And I don't care about size here. I don't care about proportions, whatever works. I'm just trying to lay out something, right? Let's do, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, that's good enough for me. Okay, so good enough for me. That gives me a general intent. I'm gonna extrude that really quickly. Terrific, awesome. And we're gonna say roughly good enough for me. Terrific. And then I'll say extrude again. I want this and this. And I'm gonna say from profile plane offset. I'm gonna start from here, right? I'm gonna go from here, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna say new body, great. And I'll bring it to roughly here, terrific. I'll go ahead and say press pull and that, push that, whoops. Turn that body off really quick just so I don't see that one. because I'm just worrying about what this thing roughly looks like. It's not about the design intent. I'm building an underlay. Combine and I'm gonna say target body is this, tool body is this. I'm gonna say cut and I'm gonna keep my tool. There we go. I'll go ahead and turn that off. 
and I'm going to give myself a little bit of clearance there. I'm going to push this back a little. Terrific. Press pull. I'm going to do this here. I'll push those back a little bit. Terrific. And now I have a general intent of where I'm going for my track and where I'm going for my uh, body of this thing. Okay. So I'll give myself a little bit more information. I'm going to say, give myself a sketch on here. I'm going to look at that. I'll give myself just a little bit of detail here. And I'm going to give myself a break point here just so I have something to talk about. There we go. My sketch is on. And I'm going to say, extrude this, 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 this. We'll send those up. Great. And now I'm going to say, extrude again. But I want that profile and that profile. I'll send those up. We'll say join. And I'll bring those together. Now, where, let me do one more here. Let's just give it a little bit of detail over here. Say okay. I'll extrude those up. Oops, not that. I want just that profile, bring that up. Great. Okay. So it's very simple. It's very to the point. Fusion has a really powerful tool in move copy. Now, most people just think about it and you're like, oh yeah, I'll just move this body and I'll slide this body over here. Sure, it works fine, right? but you can also switch this to faces. And what it allows you to do as a designer is quickly change things. So let's say this face here, I wanna angle that face up and I wanna move that face down. I can quickly change design and intent, especially for a mock-up like this, right? where I can say, move that face, and now angle that face in, push that down a little bit, and you know what? Let's also turn it this way. And notice how it extends information up here. So I can quickly build form and drive things in a different way. I'll do that one more time on here, right? And I'll push that back in this regard. I'll say, great, I'll repeat that. And this time I'm gonna move it from the corner here and I'm gonna rotate it back in that regard. So in a quick instant, I've made a really complex relationship there. And that's a big change if I wanted to build that manually. Take this one and I'll pull it over a little bit. And I've got a very interesting shape on the back of this thing, okay? I'm gonna give myself good enough for me. I've got one body, I got two bodies. Let's say mirror, and I'll switch this back to bodies, and I'll say this one and this one. My mirror plane is here. And in an instant, I have my tanked body. Did not take me much time at all to build this out and give myself a simple layout, all right? Let's go a step further and build the top of this thing so I have some sort of turret. I really like to use simple geometry here. So I'll do a sketch on here. We'll look at that and I'm gonna draw a line real quick and, and I'm gonna draw a circle, right? And there's my circle, terrific. I'm gonna use that circle to cut a hole. Oops, I don't want that, I want my profile and my profile, I'll cut a hole, great, terrific, okay? So I've got one, two, three pieces. I'm gonna go ahead and say extrude and I'll go in there and I'll grab that bottom profile face. I'll send that up and extrude it, terrific. I don't wanna join, I want a new body. And I quickly have a pin for this to rotate on. I'm gonna draw a sketch on this side, look at that. 
give myself a quick little dirty sketch. I'll use a line. Good enough for me. I'm going to say solid extrude that and I'll do one side really quick. It's going to default to cut because it sees that uh, piece right there. I can go ahead and say join if I like. There we go. We say okay. I'm going to follow suit with what I did earlier and I'll say move this face and I want to taper this face in on the side to give a nice detail to that. There we go. Repeat that. I'll move this face, angle it that way. Terrific. Good enough for me. And I've got a general turret intent. So I'm going to say mirror. I'll mirror this body. My mirror plane is this plane. Join them. That's great. And now I have this element sitting right there. Let's do a quick sketch here on this plane. Let's look at that. Make sure I picked the right one. I did not. So I'm going to finish that sketch. Everything is yelling at me here. I'm going to redefine that sketch plane. I want here. Terrific. Right. I'll look at that. I'm going to draw a quick edit that. I'm going to draw. Hold on one second. There we go. Oh, no, that's fine. What did I do there? One second. Nope, that's good. All right, we'll go with it. All right, so I'm going to draw a sketch on here, right? And I'm just going to draw a line. It's fine for me right now because this is not a finished drawing. I'm just going to say pipe that. And now I can have a general turret on there. We're going to say new body or join. That's fine. Terrific. Good enough for me. And I have a general intent. And I spent almost no time laying out this underlay. And I've used CAD as my underlay tool. And where CAD becomes super valuable in Fusion especially is I'm going to take my tank body and I'm going to right click on it. And I'm going to say create component from body. That now becomes its own part. And for the turret body, I'm going to right click. And I'm going to say create component from body. It drives that out as well. I'm going to go the shortcut and I'm going to right click on my tank body and say ground. And now I can't move this one. This one's a component. I can move it wherever I want. Okay. But I don't want to move it now. So I'm going to revert back because it's in the right position. All I have to do is an as built joint. And I can say from component to component, I'm going to say revolute. And I'm going to say my position is that cylinder and it allows it to turn. And if you've ever done a complex drawing where you have multiple vanishing points, that's really hard to set up both of those so they relate to the same turret point. And that's why I picked this for this demo because being able to do this and articulate my underlay to show dynamic movement, that's really practical for a lot of products, okay? And that saves me time because I don't wanna lay that out. I wanna just go with it, right? And so all I do now is do a quick save, right? I'll do it here and I'll say tank underlay, all right? All right, I got that. I switch over here to render. And now I'm in the rendering setup. I haven't even, as soon as it loads, now I'm sitting over here, I'm gonna turn my sketches off and I can play with a quick setup. I'll give it just an environment information. You saw me use the dry lake bed for the, uh, the one spaceship from Battlestar Galactica. I'll use that here. Um, that's nice because it gives me a horizon line and some elements. But, you know, I could also use the crossroads. That might work fine, too. 
maybe a little too reflective. Let's try the field. Okay, great. So now my little toy tank is out on the road, right? <laughs> Which is not exactly what we want for now. So great, terrific. I'll go to my settings and my position and I'll scale it, right? So I'll make the scale smaller, terrific. And now my tank is looking a little more appropriate for its size and scale. There we go. Whoops, maybe a little too much. There we go. Okay, terrific. I'm gonna position it, it is a tank, right? We're gonna move it over here and position it. And now I have a rough idea of what this might look like in its position. And again, I'm only doing this for general intent, right? And I've got a shadow here and I've got a light source, okay? So great, I'm gonna say, okay, maybe I'll change my perspective and my focal length a little bit to add some drama to it, okay? I kind of like this view here. Let's just turn it a little bit and maybe give my, let's say okay there. And I'll just move my turret just a little bit more because I can move it in the render view as well. We're gonna squint, send it right there. Okay, good enough for me. So I'm gonna say for now, because it's just an underlay, I don't have to render it. I can just capture that image and we'll say current window size. I don't, background's fine. We're gonna do whatever we want with it. And I can save it to the project, but I can also save it to my computer. So it's in the vehicle design as well. And I'm gonna say, save that. It's gonna generate that one out. And you can see here that in vehicle design, I should have my tank rendering as well. Let me refresh that, there we go. So there's my tank underlay PNG, right? I've got that in there as well. So it's part of this world. Does that make sense? Okay. If anyone has any questions, please ask because I'm gonna switch machines. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'll stop my video here and I'll keep my audio here and I'll switch to this one. Okay, and there's my meeting. Mm, there it is, and I will say screen share here. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Alex, are you the host or David, are you the host? I am the host. Can you let Jeff Walkham present? Just a sec. See. All right, you should be all set, Jeff. Okay, give me one second. I gotta switch one thing as well. Just to make sure. One more thing. And then we'll be on the right page. Why is that not showing up there? Save it there. Okay, let's try that now and we'll share that screen there. There we go, share. Okay, let's go to sketchbook here. And I gotta move that because it is totally in my way a little bit. Oh, 
Hold on, everything's fighting me on there for one second. Okay. Okay, so uh, I got to minimize this view. Okay, let's, there we go. Okay, so I've got my image here in sketchbook and what I'm gonna do is say, add image. And I'm gonna go to my desktop here, or my vir virtual desktop, I should say. And there's my tank underlay there, we'll grab that. We'll bring that in and now it's inside a sketchbook and I'm able to bring that in. And now I've got a simple layer that says, in a real instant, I have, let me delete that layer real quick. I'll turn that down and I have everything I need to start this concept. And all the difficult part of laying out this intent is gone, right? So if I grab this and I grab the ruler tool, now I can quickly give myself information. And I could say, quickly, and you saw where I'm going here, right? So I'm giving myself my vanishing points and potentially my center line here of where all these elements are going. And I'm just giving myself a point of reference for where the main body might sit, right? And now I'll just quickly trace off these elements. And now my mind has started to think about drawing mode, right? And I've used red here because I do red a lot for my um, layout structure and it gives me a good idea. But sometimes if I've got multiple pieces like this, where I've got, um, you know, a new piece on here like the turret at a different vanishing point, I'll use another color, right? And I'll use that color to quickly establish another thought process, right? So my general intent here, I've got both sides of that. I'll probably give myself like a little center point break of what that might be. And then I'll give myself information for where the far vanishing point might be. Okay. And then maybe one more here, all right? that I can't quite see it because of zoom. There we go. Okay, so I've got a general idea of what that might be. I'm gonna turn that down just a little bit and I'll turn the red one off just because I don't wanna see the red one right now. Let's focus on the turret for right now, okay? So here I sit and now I'm at the point where I'm like, you know what, let's start to think about it. So I'll give myself another layer and I like to use blue a lot because maybe because it's a blue line pencil strategy. I don't know. It just kind of seems right. And then when I use black to clean it up from that, it has a nice feeling. Okay. Um, again, maybe it's just how I worked when I was younger. So I'll start to give myself some rough intent. Man, that is off just a little bit. There we go. Okay. And I'll start to think about what this might be, right? So if I start to think about this as a slight turn here, instead of a, um, a hard edge, you know, now I can think about what that detail might be when it curves, but I'm using, 
I'm using the CAD file to get quick exploration of detail, right? And maybe there's another element here that comes around and drops down that side, but it goes higher, right? And I'm able to start to think through that and use the CAD file as an underlay. And again, I'm just thinking through this. This is not a finished design intent, but I'm able to build and grow on those selections because I have the CAD file there. And the CAD file allows me to say, well, what if this comes up like this and dictate here? And now I've got some elements on here and I haven't really worked that hard to start to build this. I'm relying on my drawing ability combined with my CAD ability. And maybe it's got a little antenna here and a little structure. It's nothing major right now. It's just what I'm starting with. And maybe there's a little element below this that has a vent detail on it. And I'm just adding a little bit of lines as I start to grow this thing and work on it. I'm adding line weight to just start to crisp off the form a little bit. And again, I've got those green lines sitting there that are telling me where my vanishing point is. So if I build a line here, I know that's going off to my vanishing point. And I know that potentially when this one here comes forward and it's gonna stop at this one, I'm able to use the quick CAD file to control that information. And maybe it goes down here. And technically that's the point where they actually meet together. And then I'm using this here to pull this forward and then to pull that side forward as well. And I'm just bringing out the details of what this shape might be. I don't care what it is. I'm using the tank just because I want to do the pivot turn because I think that's a very complicated structure, right? And I'm using my drawing ability, like I said, combined with CAD ability, right? And you can see how I've been able to start that intent for that turret. Does that make sense? I see a lot of questions there. Hold on. <laughs> or maybe those are just because I joined over here. All right, I'll pause there for a second and say any questions on what I'm doing there. Does that make sense to you guys? Do you see how I'm pulling the two together? I have a quick question about, um, you're, so you're using a tablet and a, a stylus, a, a wake, which, what specifically tools wise are so you using? What I'm, what I'm technically using here is called a Satik. It's, it's one of the Wacom screens that you're drawing on, right? You probably have them in the studio or you have them somewhere. They're a fairly common tool, but you could use an iPad and just send the image to an iPad. Um, you could print out the CAD file image and put a piece of paper over it. Doesn't matter, right? It's, it's all the principle that you're developing and building on what you've done. Right on. Right, yeah, this one happens to be a Mobile Studio Pro, which is one of their combination computers and Cintiq, but any Cintiq would work. I also have one of their Wacom Ones here, which is, which is a very to the point drawing tablet um, that you hook up to another, another screen. It's all relative. And based on what I showed you earlier, you can see that I'm doing this blue line drawing here and it's a starting point. It doesn't have to be the be all end all. I could do more concepts based on this. And if you notice, I zoom in a lot, right? Like I wanna see a close up of my image 
and I want to do my lines, you know, with some detail, but I also turn the paper a lot because that's a technical advantage of your biomechanics, right? If you turn the page a certain way, everyone draws in a certain angle better and your mind thinks better in that regard. So take advantage of that. And I do a lot of simple things like, you know, I'm going to draw a construction line that angles down here and then that angles down again and it comes out and you'd see it come out to over here, but you wouldn't see it there. Maybe there's a detail over here that's below it that goes inside. I do a lot of things that are like just below your line of sight to add details because that's very easy to add elements down here that are out of sight. I add elements a lot, like if there's text here or if there's details, or maybe if there's like a panel that opens here, I find that all those elements give you reality, right? So if there's a panel that opens right here and it comes down to here, like I find that little hinge details and things like that go a long way to make reality. Um, a lot of times I'll do little vent details like this, right? Where you just put in the elements, but you're just suggesting it right now because it's just a sketch. But from a distance, you start to see the detail start to, to pull in, right? Sometimes I will do some cross sh shadowing just to say, you know, that's below that and that element's down there. But that's all just, it's just a thumbnail, right? It's just like maybe the shadow from the turret comes up over the bottom section, right? And then I start to think about what the bottom section might look like and maybe it's really gonna point together, right? And then you just build it out and you work with it. And if this concept doesn't work, you do a new layer and you start over, right? And you start to do a new one. Could I use this one as an underlay? Yes, all of that's valid, okay? And I have what, six minutes, Alex? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay. Any questions? I'm going to switch back to my other machine so I can answer questions on that one. And I need to move this really quick. There we go. Stop my share there. Okay. And I'll come back over here and I'll share again. Screen one, share. Okay. So I've come full circle here. You've seen my process from drawing. You've seen my process break down for a CAD file. You've seen how I just use the two together, right? And let's go, let's go two steps further, right? Let's talk about Godzilla for a second, right? And so don't be afraid to challenge yourself, right? So I built this little Godzilla model as a, oh my gosh, how am I going to make this tool work, right? And I chose something very, very kitschy and interesting to kickstart my learning. And I like to show people here because I think it's fun and different. Do simple little projects like this that have no, no weight to them, no responsibility. And I don't have any renderings on there, right? Okay. Really simple, really to the point, because little experiments like this teach you a lot, okay? All of the fins on his back are the same model, just scaled down slightly. Same pieces, just bang, bang, bang. And technically, it's actually the same piece as his hand. So it gets you to learn things. Even the simple thing about mapping the little decals on for the eyeballs and making the inside of the mouth pink, do little things like this. It teaches you a ton, whether it's drawing or whether it's CAD. I'll show you this model because this is actually one of my current projects. This is something I'm working on now and I never stop learning, right? You keep pushing. This Corsair model is me getting better at file management and pushing my understanding of fusion and how complex I can do something and how I can tell a story with movement. So the prop turns, the gears articulate and fold together. 
the doors close and articulate together. Both wings fold together. The cockpit slides and opens. The rudder articulates. The horizontal stabilizers articulate. The landing gear goes in and the, the, the retention hook goes with it. The doors collapse. And technically, all the flaps articulate down as well in unison on both sides. And my ailerons technically articulate as well. And my vent array for my cooling system also articulates in unison, right? So building off of why I built that tank, this is a very much more complicated fusion file, but you could use those elements in a similar way. Okay. I'll revert that back to where it was and say, there's my lovely World War II era aircraft that I'm testing. Right. And I have two minutes. So I don't know if it's time for questions, but I paced it correctly. So any questions there? Yeah, Jeff, I'll ask you a question. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so uh, uh, awesome presentation, just awesome. You are you are you are a magician. I think you could you could you could <laughs> you could just have a a, a a website where you just entertain people with this magical. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll so try, Jeff. now now we've got to got to debunk the magic a little bit and and somehow bring this down to uh, a place where mere mortals might feel that they could achieve some segment of what you've accomplished here. And I think, I think one of the gripes, it's not really a gripe, but one of the things that I think is a challenge for, for people watching this is we're not able to see what is going on inside your mind, right? So okay. you, you, you do a nice job talking through, but um, um, I guess the, uh, the first question is, is what does, and I have two basically, but what is, what is it that the number one thing, and you've taught too, so I'm, I'm comfortable asking this question. So what is the, uh, the number one recommendation you have for people to get from the point where they are somebody who doesn't sketch much, so they don't like to sketch and they don't practice, so they don't get better at sketching. How do we get from that to somebody like yourself is when you have free time, my God, you're sketching on airplanes, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you, do it, you do it because you enjoy it, all right? So mm -hmm. what was your best recommendation for somebody to get from a not comfortable, non-sketcher to, I do this for fun when no one's watching? Okay, so that's a really good question, right? And I'll go real current. So I, if I can get that to come in there, come on, come on, come on. There we go. So I did this one the other day and you know, this is a marker sketch on tone paper, right? So this is the one I just posted the other day, right? So uh, to, to Kim's point, when you're working on tone paper, and maybe this gives the insight that, that he's looking for. Um, when you're working on marker paper or tone paper, I should say, you can't do an underlay and almost Everything I've talked about today is different ways to do underlays. Whether you do a quick CAD file, whether you use a photo, um, or whether you use your own sketch. The most important thing you can do is to repeat your work. So if you do a drawing and you're like, man, that's terrible, I don't like that. Take out a fresh piece of paper, put it over it and fix what's wrong. Because to your point, Kim, people get frustrated because it doesn't look right. Something's wrong. And they just say, I'm done. The attitude you need to take is become an investigator. Figure out what's wrong with that drawing. And the more times you figure that out, the better you get and then you can do drawings without an underlay. Everyone looks at me when I do a, a, a drawing on Canton paper or tone paper, like how are you doing that with nothing? I've done a crap ton of underlays. 
right? The amount of underlays I've done, the amount of this drawing's wrong, do a new drawing over it. Practice makes perfect. When Paul and I, and I'll bring Paul in because we went to school together, right? In Paul and I's uh, marker rendering class, you got a low grade on every single piece of homework. Don't care if it was right, wrong, or whatever, but you could redo it for a better grade. So everyone did every homework project twice. And I, to me, that is critical. If you want to become a good sketcher, and I say sketcher, not artist, you redo your own work. You have to find out what's wrong to train your brain to look for it so you don't make that mistake again. Does that, does that help, Kim, or is that, <laughs> is that where you were going? No, outstanding. Perfect. So the okay. 10,000 rule uh, applies here? The 10,000 hour totally rule? applies. You don't show up. <laughs> no, you, it totally applies. Sketch by the pound matters, right? Like, what I've always mentioned as well, if I can build on that, is if you're not drawing every day, you're not, you're not getting there. And when I say drawing every day, I'm talking about one piece of eight and a half by 11 paper. Throw a bunch of scribbles down on it. It's done. Check the box. Next day, same thing. No matter what, you draw every day. I don't care if it's five minutes. You do it. Because you are learning, you are training, right? An athlete trains every day. You drawing is a dexterity movement tied to your mind. It's the same, right? If you're not training those muscles to build up that kinetic movement, you're not going to be at that level. Pro athletes train their body. You're drawing, you're still using your body in a mind-hand connection. You have to train that. Draw every day. That's what I would say. In that button page, do one. Takes you five minutes where you're watching TV, whatever. You do two, even better. You do three, even better. And I'll tell you, it's hard to draw every day. It's hard. <laughs> I've been failing lately, but that's my goal. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Did you have a second point? Or you said there were one and two, or is that well, the if, if a student's got a question, I should let them go. Okay. Anybody have a question? Or are we out of time? Or do we let, do we let Kim ask another question? Okay, then. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of seeing uh, and drawing? Um, I'll have students tell me that uh, they they don't put as much emphasis on the drawing because they uh, they can do that awesome rendering in CAD and they can change a fillet much faster in CAD. And I can't argue with that. But I think uh, there is a connection between being able to, you, you, until you've drawn something, you haven't actually seen it, that old, old adage. Um, can you okay. talk a little bit about, about how drawing helps helps seeing and how seeing helps drawing. Sure, and I'll actually use CAD as a motif for that. And it's the same principle, right? Um, so this afternoon in my session, one of the things I wanted to do, but I ran out of time, was using drawing to modify a CAD rendering and how that's faster in some, in some point. So, when I was learning about CAD modeling, one of the things that I did a lot of was study and breakdown. I'd be walking down the street and I'd see a fender of a car and I would literally recalculate how I would build that in CAD to get the form. And to your point that seeing, analyzing, breaking it down, right? And I think that is a really valid point for both CAD and drawing, right? Because if you're thinking that hard 
about the geometry and how to make it in CAD, well, you've thought real hard and you've studied it, you should be able to draw it now, right? So to Kim's point, when you see something, you need to analyze it, right? And this sounds really off base, but the next time you wash your car, feel the form. Feel what the forms do. You can learn a lot about sculpture and a lot about automotive design when you wash a car, if you're a designer. That's a really weird statement, but the next time you do it, feel the shapes, look at the shapes, and the combination of looking and touching, you will really understand what's going on. Um, I guess maybe that's why I still wash my own car. I, I, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> but you, you do learn a lot by looking studying and touching, right? Um, you know, I, I play my card way too, way too easy. Like I am fascinated by World War II era aircraft. The combination of blunt geometry and elegance, there's something about it. It just, there's an efficiency. So find the thing that interests you, right? I go to the museums and I study the planes and I'll touch them and I'll look at them. And you're like, wow, that's fascinating. Like, how did they do that? How do they form the metal that way? Right. Find something you care about. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be furniture. It could be video game design. It could be concept design somewhere. There's find something that really interests you to learn about the form and that will help your drawing and help your CAD and really pull the two together is what I would say. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. I think sometimes we forget when we're drawing, sketching, working in CAD, that we're actually generating something in 3D. So that old idea of, uh, of uh, interacting with a form physically. Mm -hmm. uh, very good point. Yeah. Because I it, mean, but, it, but if you think about it, whether it's CAD or whether it's a piece of paper, you're still looking at something that's a 2D plane, but it's 3D inside it. 